Never breaks his covenant. Solidly dependable. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can trust him. You can do business with him. At the beginning of the fall of the Soviet Empire, Margaret Thatcher, the great iron lady, was prime minister. And I remember. When there was a, a reorganization in uh, the party in Soviet Union and Gorbachev became the first secretary, and it was the first secretary of the party that was ruling the, 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 the party, more or less, he becomes president or prime minister, whatever. And after the first few talks with Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher gave a news conference. I remember her saying, Secretary Gubachor is a man with which we can do business. It's a great statement. And she was right. She did business with Gubachor. And with Ronald Reagan, the history of the world changed. The Cold War was over. Soviet Union was disbanded because Gubachor was there. If it had been somebody else, it might have been difficult to do business with. So what I'm saying to you is that God keeps faith. He is the only being with whom you can do business and he will not shortchange you. Who is this Lord? Who is this God? The Lord who made heaven and and earth. And not only that, he is the one who executes justice for the oppressed. Moses understood that. The people of Israel have been oppressed. Now God has come to, to what? To execute justice. He will not only take them out, he will, he will give them reparations. All the years they are spent in Egypt, the people of Egypt will pay them for it. And that was why when they are going out, God asked the people of Israel, each of them to ask his neighbor, pay up, it's pay up time. Give me gold, give me silver. It's justice. They are paying back all the, all the time they have, what? Misused them. Trust the Lord. The psalmist says, trust in the Lord. You will fight your battle. When you win that battle, everything you have lost plus will be returned to you. He gives justice for the oppressed. Who is this God? He is the God who gives food to the hungry. He is the God who what? Who gives food to the hungry? He gives food to those who are hungry. Food. And I pray that if you have been hungry, God will give food to you. But he doesn't give food to the lazy. He doesn't give food to indolent people who will not walk, who don't want to walk. Who is this God? is the law that sets the prisoners free. The people of Israel were prisoners under the Egyptians. He came to set the prisoners free. He is the same Lord God that we serve that sent Jesus Christ to come and take captivity captive. 
and to set us who have been prisoners of the devil, to set us free from the clutches of the devil. No one else can. No church can. No minister can. No priest can. Only God can with his finger. Is the Lord. Who is this God? Verse 8 says, He is the Lord that opens the eyes of the blind. Those who are inly blind or outwardly blind. Those who are physically blind. We have seen many cases whereby the Lord opened their eyes. And of course, 99% of people in the world are spiritually blind. He can give them sight. And for servants of God, most servants of God are also blind. God said in the Bible, who is blind but my servant? Who is deaf but my anointed one? Don't go to juju people to see vision. Go to God. It can open your inner eye to give you inner sight to see things that are happening in his divine realm. I'm choosing my words very carefully. I didn't say spiritual realm because there are so many parts of spiritual realm. I'm talking about divine. Divine refers only to the almighty God. That is the God we serve. That is the God you should serve. He opens the eyes of the blind. Who is this God? He is the, the Lord that lifts up those who are bowed down. Come on, you have been complaining for a long time that you are down. I'm depressed. I'm down. My life is not going well. Trust this God. The question we are asking is, who is God? And I'm telling you, even with the words of this Psalm 146, verse 8, he is the one that can lift you up from the dungeon that the devil had dumped you. Richard Nixon once said that it is a man who had gone to the bottom of the valley that knows what it is to be on top of a cliff. And somebody else said, when a man is at the bottom of the valley, there's only one way to go, up. Otherwise, he dies there. So if you think you are at the bottom of the valley in your life, there's only one way for you to go now. It's up. Otherwise, you will die where you are. And there's no way you can go up unless somebody pulls you up. Let him pull you up. He's the only one that can pull you up. He lifts up those who are bowed down. And there are two ways by which he can lift you up. By extending his hand to you, to pull you. If you see his hand, grab it. Or he will send you a rope. He will, he will lower a rope. Cling to that rope. And he will pull you up. And I can tell you, most of the time, he will send you a rope. On few occasions, he will stretch his hand to pull you. Stretching his hand to pull you is very rare. Because that one is reserved for those who are special and those, those who cling to him seriously. But for the ordinary who, who don't even care for him, he lowers a rope to them in that valley. What is the rope? People like me, his servants, or ordinary Christian, he will send that person to you as a rope to give you the word of life that will raise you up. Take the word that is coming out of his mouth. Take the help he offers you and come out. God has used many ropes like that to go to people 
in the deepest dungeon with the word of God. And those who have spoken the word and they have invited them to their church and they got to the church. The word of life continued and they got out of that mess and their lives were turned around, turning point. You see, it is that woman or that man that God sent to you that is the rope through which you climb out of the dungeon. So look out for the hand of God or the rope. Either one will pull you out from where you have been bowed down. Who is this God? Verse 8 continues. He is the Lord who loves the righteous. He is the Lord who loves the righteous. That is why you must endeavor to be righteous so that he may continue to love you. Once you indulge in unrighteousness, is the pattern of the ways. It's like a man and a woman. They fell in love. They married. And then suddenly, the wife began to have extracurricular activities outside. You understand my meaning? Private practice. And if the man discovers, it will be what? The pattern of the ways. Even if the family prevails and beg him, what is broken can never be the same again. So once you go into a life of unrighteousness, you are breaking the chain, the paternal filial relationship between you and the Lord God Almighty. And that's a dangerous thing to do. That was why Jesus came to tell us, do not be anxious about tomorrow. What to eat, what to wear, we have to live. For the, for, for, for the Gentiles crave after these things. But for you, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all its righteousness and all those other things will be added to you. But 90% of the Christians don't believe in that. And yet they, they claim to trust God. They claim to believe in Jesus. But those who fall on deaf ears, 90% of Christians every day, their, their minds and their hearts are centered on what to eat, what to drink, what to wear, where to, to sleep. And every prayer that comes out of the Mouth of 90% of Christians are prayers of give me what to eat. Give me what to wear. The car to drive. Let me be like other people. Let me be comfortable. I may not be rich, but make me comfortable. Semantics, isn't it? Now, for a true Christian, what you are to eat or drink is not your business. It's none of your business. Your business, first and foremost, is to seek how to enter the kingdom of God. And the next one is to do what is right in the sight of God. And that's what righteousness is. Do what is right in the sight of God. Now, that does not mean that you should not go and walk. Because righteousness, part of righteousness, like uh, righteousness, like I said to you, is doing what is right in the sight of God. And it is right in the sight of God for you to walk. Because the Bible says, he who does not walk should not eat. It is part of what is right to do your work and do it well. Jesus taught the slaves that he preached to and Paul and Peter also taught them the same. Don't take advantage of your masters. Slaves, serve your masters better. Serve your masters better. Then you show them an example of what a Christian is. In other words, it's asking them to work hard. Again, the Bible says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Now, that is what is right in the sight of God. Not for you to be employed and 
you don't do it well, you say you are reading the Bible when you are supposed to be at work, you are a failure. If that can't be right in the sight of God, you are cheating your employer. When you are offered a job and you refuse that job and you want to be taking unemployment benefit, money that others who are struggling, who are toiling day and night are getting, that, that can't be right. I can, I can understand if you, if you look for a job, you don't get a job. But when you are sleeping in your house from morning till night, and you are not looking for any job, and you say you are a born-again Christian, you're wrong. You're wrong. Do what is right. Because righteousness exalts a nation. And a nation is an aggregate of the individuals in that place. In other words, righteousness exalts the individual. The accumulation of which now becomes the exaltation of the whole nation. Who is this God? The psalmist continues in verse 9. He is the Lord who watches over the sojourners. Who are the sojourners? Visitors. Immigrants, tourists. If you are visiting any place or you are traveling in a plane or a boat or train, whatever, to visit any place, it is this Lord who controls the universe, who made all the elements that can conspire to make your plane crash. It is this God that will make sure your plane does not crash. It is this God that will make sure that where you go to, like America, where everybody carries a gun. And like in Britain, where every youth carries a knife. It is the Lord God Almighty who will make sure that they don't stab you or they don't shoot you. He watches over the visitors. He opposes the widow and the fatherless. You are a widow. And when the going was good, before your husband died, both of you thought the earth belonged to you. And you took the, the blessing of God in Genesis chapter 1 very seriously that you should uh, reproduce and multiply. And in five years of marriage, you had 12 children. And suddenly, your husband died. And you are a widow with 12 children. And you put your hand on your head and you scream, You are dead. Your life is ruined. You had better die. Don't die. Trust in the Lord. He will take care of you. And your Trevor and have children, he will take care of them all. In a miraculous way. Trust him. These days, these days, the British, don't let me say Europe. I do not know about uh, Europe. I know about British. There is this uh, family planning. Most people want to have 1.1 children. In other words, one boy, one, one girl, and that's it. If, if you ask them, why not more? Oh, no. It's too expensive. The cost of uh, uh, child's clothes, the cost of uh, baby coat, the cost of uh, uh, nursery, the cost of this, the cost of that. And that's one of the things that show that Britain is not a Christian country. And that's one of the things that show that Nigeria is a Christian country. Because Ni Nigeria in the past 20 years have moved from a population of about 60, 80 million, now the 140 million. Now that's people who believe in God. The last census, 140 million. Britain have been around 50 million for 20 something years now. And we are still in, in, in Britain, we are still about 53 million or 55 million. That's all. That's all. And that is immigrant included. In Nigeria, you can count the Im immigrants 
in Nigeria, there can't be more than one million, if at all. Nigerians have such a faith in procreation, but that is the end of their faith. They haven't got any faith in any other thing. <laughs> now, jokes aside now. He says he opposed the widow and the fatherless. You lost your mother, you lost your father in tragic circumstances, either motor accident or in Iraqi war or whatever. And you and your siblings, eight of you, and you are the oldest, six years old. All the others are, are younger than you. And suddenly, at the age of eight, you are a parent to your siblings. Where, where do you begin? I tell you where you begin and end. Begin by focusing on God for the rest of your life. He will bring you help. He knew before what happened to you happened to you. He knew how it will happen to you, and he knew the provision he has made for you. There is always a life after disaster. He controls such situations. He will control such in your life. Even as you are hearing me, some of you, as you are hearing me, you will be in sorrow. You may have just been bereaved, or God forbid, you may be bereaved tomorrow. He's there for you. Just turn your eyes to Jesus. One hymn says, turn your eyes unto Jesus and look into his wonderful face. And all the things of the world will grow strangely dim in the power of his glory and love. Who is this God? He is the one who can handle the difficult situation in your life. The only one. And when everything else fails, there is a power you can use. The power of prayer. To seek his help. Who is this God? The Lord that watches over the, the sojourners, that is, strangers. The Lord that upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the will of the wicked he brings to ruin. He will deal with with those who are perpetrating wickedness against you, the battle will never be yours. It is the Lord's battle. Suddenly they tell me, I have five minutes more, when I have not even uh, 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 discussed this, this, this context. Anyway, let me quickly go over it. So going back to Exodus chapter 8 now, verse 20. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and wait for Pharaoh as he goes out of the water and say to him, Thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into the houses and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. Verse 22, but on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put a division between my people and your people. By tomorrow shall this sign be. Hey, that is God. Speaking from his own mouth. He separates the sheep from the goat. When judgment comes. So those of you who think that when God comes down, you, you will just be able to mix with the righteous so that he will give all of you direct entry. You are wrong. He will separate the sheep from the goat. The people of Israel into Goshen and the people of Egypt will be where they are. When the swarms of fly will, will come, it will touch the people in Egypt. It will not touch those in Goshen. That is figuratively speaking. In other words, if you are wicked, when God's punishment comes, it will touch you. It will not touch those who are righteous because it will separate them. He will make a division. Then you will know that he is the Lord. 
who protects the sojourner, the widow, the fatherless, but who deals ruthlessly with the wicked. No one else can do like that except himself. And on this occasion, he gave a time scale. Many times when God threatens to punish, he does not give a time scale. But in some cases, he gives a time scale. In this case, he said, tomorrow. By tomorrow shall this sign be. And the Lord did so. Verse 24 says, and the Lord did so. And there came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and his servants' houses, and so on and so forth. The magicians of Pharaoh, where are they? The sorcerers, where are they? They were gone. They could not match it. So, to update you on this course, 5-3. Moses was scoring five goals against Pharaoh, scoring three. God will also win in any encounter with the devil. Light will always prevail in a direct fight or indirect fight with darkness. And so it has always been. And so it will always be. Forever and forever. But all the things that you have been hearing, here and there, here and there, in these teachings, you are writing your notes. Highlight them. Assemble them together. Extract them from your notes as outlines so that you can know with what to catch God any time. It will strengthen your hopes and renew your strength in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.